It is my privilege and joy that we can continue our Bible study in the crucible with Christ, having today the subtitle, Indestructible Hope. Yes, we have the hope and the belief and the certainty that Jesus is coming in our days. And we will see him coming. And we have that hope that we will stand on the day when he appears. Because he has done a work through us and in us, a work of cleansing in which we have cooperated with him and we have come to the point of being clean and holy so that we can bring an offer to God in righteousness. When he appears, we will have the souls that he gave us to bring as an offering before him. What a privilege, what a joy will be that day when we will see him together with all the souls that he has given us. But until now, we are still in that process in which we have to realize the impurity of our spirit, that is, to be in the lie, to think that we are something that we are not. This is the state in which we are born. And we must come to the state of being clean, that is, to be in the truth. Because the spirit can only be in a state of deception or in a state of truth. And as we have seen last time, we must understand clearly how the spirit functions so that we can co-work with God in solving the problem. The spirit has an entrance and an exit. He has needs, love, freedom, justice and many others. And he must take them from outside, from a source. That source offers him the satisfaction of his needs by an information that he takes in by faith. The source offers also a binding that the spirit takes through trust. And when he have taken in through faith and trust the information, the will does with it something and decides about it. So the will is at the exit of the spirit, he puts the body into motion. And as the first reaction of the body we have seen is the emotions. And then comes all we are doing with the body, talking, working, everything the spirit does, he does through decisions. And there is no decision that doesn't come into the body because that's why he needs a decision because he can do nothing without the body because we are a soul. So, what is that what is decisive for the spirit and the body since the body is conducted by the spirit? What is that what is decisive? And that is the state in which the spirit is, that is, is in the truth, then God is automatically his source of information. The word of God is his food and God is his trust. He's bound to God and everything in his life runs well. But we know that we are born with the deception in us. Adam deceived himself, Eve as well. And so they give us an inheritance that is death. This inheritance must be exchanged with the inheritance that God has given us to Christ. He is our heir. And that's why we need to understand how to change that uh, inheritance, the one we must crucify. But how can we crucify the deception if we don't see it? Because this deception binds us to Satan and people. And as long as there is no problem with the people we are bound to, we are living good and fine. That's why God must, in his love, bring difficulties between us and the people and, of course, Satan, whom we are bound to. That's why he says, I will put enmity. So here it is. The crucible, the fire, the heat sets on at the wrong love source. Here is the heat. If I am in the wrong love source and my mother passed away or someone denies me or someone rejects me, whatever happens, I will take my will into prison and I will try to change those 
external circumstances because they are against me, I believe. And as my will is trapped and is full in coercion, he wants to coerce those around him, he wants to force them to do the good, our emotions in our body become negative and our body has pain and disease. He doesn't function anymore like he should. And all that because the deception is in us. If the deception would not be there, the will would remain free and the body healthy. But now we are all born in this state of deception. And it is without question, God needs to do something to show us this state. And he can only show us through the people around us when they are not like they should, when things are not going like the needs of the Spirit are that they should go. So the reason of the heat is to make known the error of the heart. Who am I? Because that's the reason of the heat. I must see clearly the deception in order to crucify it and take the truth. That's why I made a list of the main triggers that bring out the error in us. What is that triggers the error the most? Now, the error and the spirit must be bound to someone for information and for binding. So we need information and binding. And I go first through the information. The information that will trigger the error is something that is opposite to our needs of the spirit. We see and hear people, how they speak evil about us. It's the lack of love or rejection. Now, one of the greatest trauma is seen in psychology when mother rejects the child. And the child then becomes very sick and very disabled through his whole life. But not because of the rejection of the mother, but because of the state of the child, of course unconscious, to go against that. The expectation that mother needs to love me, that she needs to be there for me, comes from the error of the heart. And I know God will never allow those things if it would not have been for the good of that child and all those around it. One day, God will show why he brought what in whose life and no one will complain, but everyone will be agreeing that if they would have been in God's place, they would have brought it the same way. Now, since rejection is the most difficult thing for the lie. Our Lord had to go through the most difficultest situations to the greatest heat so that it should come out of him what is in him. And since he had the inheritance from his father, the truth, and lived by his inheritance from his father, never through the inheritance from his mother, he showed when he was rejected, he did not reject. Sinful nature will, when it is accepted, it will also accept. When it is loved, it will also love. That's something natural for sinful nature. And that's why in order to trigger it, to show if it's there or not, something must be put against her or against the need of the Spirit. And so Jesus was rejected and despised of men. He came to his own, and his own did not take him in. His own did not receive him. That means they rejected him. That must be a terrible uh, temptation. You come to those to help. And they say, thank you, we don't need your help. Jesus 
was in the truth. He said, they don't reject me, but they reject my father. And when they crucified him and when he went through all the temptations he went, he always showed that he was in the truth, never in the lie. He always put his fathers first, said, well, they do wrong to my father. He has to forgive them. When they have beaten him, when they have done to him pain and mocked him, he said, they do it to my father. My father will take care for that. That's being in the truth. Then you don't have your eyes focused on the ones that do you wrong. Like here. Here you don't, you just see the people that do wrong. People, it's amazing when I talk to them, I see it, they don't see it, that they speak all again, again, again about the person that did them wrong or what is wrong in the world. Their focus is not on the Father. Their focus is on their love source, the people that do the wrong. Isn't it amazing? I spoke today with a lady I know for long from the church and how she is devastated because her husband rejects her. And she says, through my whole life, rejection was that what came with me. And of course, she did something against. She pleased those around him. She pleased her husband for all that time that she has been married with him. But all she realizes is it was rejection. He just used me. That might be true what the other does. But it's not true that he did it to me. He did it to my owner, to whom I belong. So I leave the judgment with him. I don't need to take that in my hands. That sinful nature in which we are must judge. Sinful nature must take over and must do to the other what it thinks is his right. So when rejection appears and out of me or you come out that we are focused on the one who did it to us, we are wrong. We must change our focus to our Father. We must look to Him and say, Oh, they do it to you, my Father. You will take care. Because you know better every heart. But I don't want to take your place. To take things personally. And to get into trouble. I leave it to you. What? A privilege we have to know this. To not focus anymore on those who have done us wrong. But focus on him and say, it's a father's business. It's not mine. Friends, it's, that's the victory that we have to gain. That will be the victory when we are in the truth, the children of our father. Another thing is oppression. Have you ever been oppressed by others? Or have you been treating Unjustly, we have the example of Habakkuk and the situation he finds the, we could say, the church of God uh, in, and, and Habakkuk is um, so called a last day prophet because that what is mirrored here will happen in our times as well and happens. He says, verse 2 from chapter 1, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? So, it is not that God shows him the iniquity, he just lets him see it. 
for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment does never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. So Habakkuk is real in what he experiences. And in his heart, we will see, does not lie the, the lie, but he is in the state of the truth because he cares about his people. It is the same like Elijah. You see, Elijah see the, the decay, the spiritual decay of his nation. And he says, Lord, we have to do something about this. And he cries unto the Lord and says, let's not reign for three and a half years so that they might see on whom they are dependent. That they might see their state in which they are. God listened to him. It was three and a half years. It was a drought. But did the people wake up? We just know from the Bible that there was a separation between the good and the evil. And there was a sifting process in those days. But we see at the end, we don't know if some were uh, reformed and became uh, alive from their that state. So Elijah was doing something in God's will. He wanted the salvation and he was in the truth when he did that. The same is Habakkuk. He sees the things and he wants that God should bring an intervention. Now we also see what happens around us in these last two and a half years. We have never experienced such a thing before. And I don't speak for me as well, I know for all. And I think sometimes, why did it hit me so strongly? And I think maybe because I'm a physician. And it is about health and our or disease. And when it's something that it is in your profession and you see that the whole world goes wild in the wrong direction, you must get alert. So what came out of me? Was it the truth? I must confess it was not the truth. My eyes were focused on what others did. My eyes was focused not on the Father, of course, he called again and again, and I have never learned to trust God as I have learned these last two and a half years. So that's why I'm very thankful. He showed me the error so that I could cut it away and replaced it, step by step. But I was focused on what others are doing. I was not focused on my father to say, Father, you're in control. Everything will be fine. You will bring judgment. It's your business, not mine. Oh, it's a hard thing. If you have a, uh, an idea about yourself that you're a God, you must fix the problems outside of you. And you might be right. And I was right in the way I see things. But in the way I act, I'm not right. Because I take it as for me, I take it as it is an attack on myself. I take it like I have to bring judgment now over the world. I take the place of God. Was it intentionally? Was it even consciously? Not at all. And I was not so much engaged in, in the political situation. My issue was the church and the church leaders. 
I never experienced rejection so much than in the last two and a half years. I never experienced a lack of love from my, my fellow church members as before. I never was rejected so much by my own church. I mean by the leaders of the church, the conferences. Never ever. And what came out? And thank God that it came out. It was there. If it would have not been there anymore, if I would have been clean in my heart, of course, my focus would be like in the life of Jesus, looking to Jesus, to God, and say, okay, Father, can we do something about it? But I took the place and fought the wrong battle. And I was often sick. I thank God for that. And I tell you, it's not an easy thing because it's so deep in us, the error. And it always fools us with the good. So we want the good. Elijah did what he could. He prayed that God should do something. Habakkuk prays that God should do something. Well, he did not pray that people should be healed. They did not pray that the heat should go away like we have prayed. Because the heat came from God. Elijah prayed for the heat. He prayed that it should not rain. And God listened to him. He was a simple man, but he had an idea how he could revive his people. It was not by sunshine in the way that, you know, having everything. No, it was that sunshine that, that dries up everything. And he was among them. And he was protected by God. The same does Habakkuk. And God speaks to Habakkuk and tells the righteous, We'll live by faith. And he says to the people around here, say, woe unto those who do this and that in chapter 2. It's very clear. On our actions, we must see what is in us, in which state we are. And the nice thing is at the end, from verse 16, chapter 3 of Habakkuk, he gives us an answer of that and the perspective of that, what we are going through as well. When I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered, quivered at the voice. A rottenness entered unto my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the wines, the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like Heinz's feet, and he will make me to walk upon my high places. So, this is the example of Habakkuk. Habakkuk sees the things coming, but he knows who is his strength. He saw all the problems, he saw that the judgment will come. And he was agreeing with it. He was agreeing with the troops who would come to destroy Jerusalem. God must judge the world and he starts with his people. Are we praying more for judgment or more for peace? Are we praying for the intervention of God that things should finally come to an end and we could work with him? 
Or, or are we praying for a smooth life, peaceful one, in which all things are like we had them before? It's time for the end. And it's time that we need to co-work with God in finishing this work. That's why we should take all crisis, all lying and cheating that comes in our lives and all forces and coercion as something that says, okay, if we are in the truth, we are focused on God, not on those who coerce or lie or cheat us. So there is one danger, the deeds of the love source. And the other is the binding when Someone takes away the wrong love source because the good one cannot take it away, but even the good one will be put under pressure, as we will see. So separation from the loved one through moving away, that person we are bound to moves away, or it divorces from us, or it stops having a contact with us, or it dies. I just speak recently with a lady, 76 years old, her, her husband died two years ago, and her sister six years ago, and she lost, uh, she said, I, 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 I drained. I said, yes, because she goes to bed with the thought on her husband, and she wakes up with the thought of her husband. She thinks all the time around her love source. That must be changed. That must be changed. We must not turn around anymore a human being because it drains us. It, it tores us away. And she's a Christian and she understood it and she, she was amazed on, on what she did and she said, well, I, I want to get rid of this. So God needs to intervene so that we should have no love source in the human anymore. That he proved with the life of Job. Job was clean in his heart. When God took all things away from him, he said, I'm God. I'm not, I, I do not live by that what God has given me. He gives it, it takes away, and he ne never sinned. But he came into a stronger heat than normal people. He came into the heat of thinking that God has left him. Because he was attached to God, but now he misses him. He misses him in his pain. And he cries out. Job never sinned in this process. He was just not aware that it was a needed experience to prove God's righteousness. It was a needed experience to prove that he was in the truth and he was ready for, to live in the new world, in the new re restored universe. God answered him after he passed the test. And God showed him. And Job said, yes, I have spoken unwisely because I didn't know. But now that I know, I will not speak again. And he said, until now I have known you from hearing, but now my eyes have seen you. Experience. When Job realized the plans of God, he was excited about it. All the suffering was past because now he knew for what he had to suffer. He was relieved from it. The same Habakkuk knows for what he's going through in the future. But he says, what can happen to me? If everything is taken away from me, and even God might hide himself, his face from me, I still will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God 
of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He's in the truth. He lives from God. And even though when he experienced that and we will experience that, we have no alternative. Because we know if, if we lose God, we can not replace him with anything else. We have that past experience already. We got rid of all those wrong love sources. We won't stay or won't return to that. We stay with God. If he turns his back unto us, we will still trust him. Like Job said, even if he kills me, I trust him. And we must do this process in our reason. As we saw last time, the result of all things must be weighed in reason. And in the reason lies the choice of grace. We must consciously realize the deception in order to replace it with the truth. This is not a mystical process like, God, do you, you do it. No, that's not possible. I must do it. it. I must do it together with God. But it is my work. Because no one can handle my spirit. No one can do something in my spirit except me. The power is in God's word. When I take it in, that word gives me the power. And in this way, he lives in me. But that word I will only take if I know that I am his child. And if I'm his child, whenever I'm in dis distress, I will look to him. Because through Christ, I am his. And we have started a journey with Christ. We are traveling with him on the narrow path to the final destination. And when we started on this path, we had wagons and horses and all kinds of uh, things we cling to. The road was quite right to take it. But then the path is getting narrower. It's the same picture like with the crucible. The heating getting stronger as we process because only with the greatest heat, the deepest evil or uncleanness in our spirit gets out before it, we cannot see it. That's why God makes and guides this process step by step. And we must consciously, gradually removing and replacing the truth. That is the process. And in this process, something interesting is, and I can tell you from my experience from 19 years after I started this road, you have the impression you don't advance. And this comes because the greatest things God handles here. As we go on, it comes to the little things that didn't disturb you back then because you have bigger ones that disturb you. But now the bigger ones pass away and now things disturb you that you never had disturbance before. They didn't come out before because there were bigger ones there. So God removes the bigger and comes to the smaller ones. I tell you, it looks like it's never ending the road. And it looks like you don't advance. But thank God, we can look back and we can see at least that in all the things past, he has guided us. And he brought us through, no matter in which state we were. So we have that experience. But when we are in a certain situation and we react the same like in other situations with the same type of reactions. Now the type of reaction is similar. You cannot get rid of anger at once because you have many things you can get angry. 
Now, I don't get angry on this here, but I get angry on this now. But this shows that I'm still wrong because my anger proves that I mean the lie. This is why in this process, the greatest danger is to be discouraged because you have an expectation on advancing, I would say, in the wrong perspective. Our sinful nature wants results. And it, it wants results immediately. And when we see that it doesn't come immediately, when we cry out there and the Lord seems not immediately to answer, we might think we're lost. We might think he has forgotten us. And we might get into a similar situation of despair and discouragement. This is the greatest danger on this path. It's not the narrowness of the path. It's because we might become tired. But you only become tired when we fight the wrong way of the battle. But deception will will suggest that to us. And I said to God, I don't want never to be discouraged. I don't want to, to step back, no matter what comes. And for this, I need something, and you as well. You need hope. What is hope? Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. Yes, we hope to be clean one day. That's our hope. The evidence of things not seen. I don't see my state. I just see, okay, that's wrong. I see that I'm in prison. But the first thing that I should never leave out of my mind, of my reason, is hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped. I don't want never to let discouragement take me. And the only armor I have against it, the only thing that keeps me from it is hope. Hope. Every day. You and I need at every step hope because we see with the evil eye that there is no advancement. Don't worry. We still go forward. We will never say it doesn't work for me. No. We don't accept that thought of our evil nature. And we will exercise hope. And again hope. And everyday hope until we reach reality. That is our battle. And with an indestructible hope, the battle will be won. But for this, the hope needs to be indestructible. Arrived at the destination, the reliance on earthly sources of love has disappeared. We just cling to those courts that come from above. Those courts that are our faith, our hope, in which we are bound. And we have nothing under our feet anymore. It's gone. But we are in faith alone. And we will pass over to the other side through trusting God alone. And God alone, we trust. In this journey that we have to go, we know that Christ went before and he goes with us. We must do it. It's not that God can do it for us, no. It's our path that must walk the, this path. It's not God who walks for us. 
how wrongly some Christians believe. But that's irreality. We must expel this terrible nature from our hearts. And we have a strong inheritance. We have the inheritance of Christ. Through him, we have a connection to the Father. And together with the Father, we will surely win. We will surely win and destroy that thing in us. And what keeps us when we don't see anything is hope. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Amen.